Right, good morning everyone. It is 10 o'clock, so we will um, open up the meeting of the Cabinet on the 30th of June. Um, I'm Councillor Spencer Flower, I'm Leader of Council and I'm going to chair this meeting today. And this is our second virtual Cabinet meeting and um, I think we've learned an awful lot in the last uh, a couple of months in how we deal with uh, stuff virtually. So first of all, I'd like to um, have a roll call of participants, particularly on the Cabinet and then officers. So can I start with with asking Peter Wharf, please? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm just checking that I'm on. Can you hear me, Chairman? Yep. Thank you, Chairman. It's Councillor Peter Wharf and I'm the Deputy Leader of Dorset Council. And your role, Peter? Your uh, I'm oh, cabinet mem member for change and transformation. Thank you. Tony Alford. Uh, good morning. I'm Tony Alford and I'm the portfolio holder for customer, community and regulatory services. Ray Bryan. Yes, I'm Councillor Ray Bryan. I'm the portfolio holder uh, for highways, transport and the environment. Graham Carr Jones. Morning Chairman, Graham Carr Jones, Housing Portfolio Holder, Community Safety and Emergency Planning. Tony Ferrari. Uh, morning Chair, uh, Tony Ferrari, Finance Board Holder, Portfolio Holder for Finance, Commercial and Assets. Thank you. Laura Miller. Morning Chair, Laura Miller, Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care and Health. Andrew Parry. Harry, I'm the portfolio holder for children, education and early health. Gary Suttle. Good morning, I'm Gary Suttle. I'm the portfolio holder for economic growth and skills. And last but not least, David Walsh. Good morning, Chairman. I'm David Walsh, Cabinet Member for Planning. Thank you. Thank you, David. Officers, Matt Prosser. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, Matt Prosser, Chief Executive, Dorset Council. Jonathan Mayer. Good morning, Chairman. Jonathan Mayer, Corporate Director for Legal and Democratic and Monitoring Officer. Aidan Dunn. Uh, good morning, Chair. Aidan Dunn, Executive Director of Corporate Development <coughs> and Section 151 Officer. John Selgren. John Selgren, Executive Director for Place. Theresa Levy. Good morning, Teresa Levy. Good morning, Teresa. Executive Director for Children. Yes, can't hear you. Vivian, Vivian Broad, Broadhurst. Good morning, Chair. Executive Director for Housing and Adults. Yeah, you're you're quite faint, actually. You might want to just see if you can be a little louder when we get to you. Uh, okay. Kate Critchell. Good morning, Chairman. Kate Critchell, Democratic Services. Uh, Paul Ingledon. Morning, Chairman. Paul Ingledon, Public Health Consultant. Rupert Lloyd. Do we have Rupert Lloyd? I'll keep going if we haven't. Don't hear from him. Susan Ward Rice. Good morning, Chair. Susan Ward Rice, Diversity and Inclusion Officer. John Newcomb. Good morning, Chair. John Newcomb, Licensing Community Safety Manager. Thank you. Andy Frost. Good morning, Chair. It's Andy Frost, Service Manager for Community Safety in Adults and Housing. Karen Punchard. Good morning. Karen Punchard, Corporate Director for Place Services. Dave Thompson. Good morning, Dave Thompson, Corporate Director for Property and Assets. Matt Piles. Chairman, I think sending apologies this morning as attending a COVID meeting and I think not required to support a paper at this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, we've got Susan Dallison. Good morning, Chairman, producing the meeting this morning. And Lindsay Watson. Also helping, I think, isn't she? Yes, also producing. Thank you. Well done. Okie doke. Thank you very much. Right, Kate, apologies. Do we have any apologies? I don't think we have. You've disappeared. Sorry, fatal mistake. I've got to unmute myself. Well, no apologies, Chairman. OK, thank you. Uh, minutes of the meeting on the 5th of May. Uh, can I sign those when I get the opportunity in the future? Can I sign those as a true record? Anyone against that? Or can I? Can you all agree? I agree. Thank you very much. 
declarations of interest. I'm not aware of any. If, any, if anything crops up in the meeting, please make me aware on the, on the chat line so I can deal with it. So we now move on to uh, public participation. Um, we have a number of questions this morning, five actually, or four questions and a statement. And the questions are going to be read out by either Jonathan Mayer or Matt Prosser, but I'm not quite sure who's starting it, but uh, I'll, I'll hear them when they start. So either John or, or Matt, please. Shall I, shall I start, Chairman? I've got my uh, camera turned on. So this is a question from Nigel Shearing. So given the coronavirus restrictions and impacts on the town centre's economy, can the Cabinet Committee give an assurance to a local action group, Respect Weymouth, looking after the interests of residents living behind the North Harbour side and up, that emerging support for invigorating licensing and hospitality will be lawful, balanced and respectful without adverse impacts on people's right to enjoyment of their private space and home, particularly given this is a cumulative impact area. There are serious concerns that the balance is not going to be achieved. Licensees are attempting to permanently introduce things on the back of the restriction for the worse, and residents have been suffering considerable impacts for too long already. I think I hand over to the response from the portfolio holder for customer community and regulatory services, Councillor Tony Alford. Uh, thank you. Can I thank Hi. Mr. Shearing? Can I thank Mr. Shearing for his timely question? We all wish to see our economy and also make a good recovery, including the hospitality sector, which is key to the lives of our town centres. I know that officers are working with partners, including the Dorset Police, business groups and operators to help manage the implications of the easing of restrictions and the reopening of our high streets and licensed premises. In conjunction with our partners, we will monitor and assess the situation and take action to address any significant issues that arise. You may be aware that the government are temporar temporarily relaxing restrictions on the use of public space around such premises and highways officers have been working to ensure that public safety is not compromised by implementing additional traffic management measures on our high streets. I would also mis refer Mr Shearing to the item on our agenda today about the launch of a public consultation on Dorset Council's draft statement of licensing policy. This is an opportunity to help shape local controls around the sale and consumption of alcohol to strike a balance between the enjoyment of licensed premises, safeguarding public health and the protection of residents' rights. Thank you, Tony. I've now got a question from Penny Quilter. I think uh, Jonathan's going to read that. Chairman, um, yes, this question has um, a preface, but as the questions have, uh, have been published online, I'll just go straight to the question. Given the urgent need to change travel habits before the restart takes effect, the government has called for measures to be taken as swiftly as possible and in any event within weeks. That was already five weeks ago as at 30th June, since when the restart has commenced and levels of road traffic have rapidly risen. Dorset Council has called for public suggestions but set an end date for that consultation of 31st July, by which time it will be 10 weeks since government called for swift action. Given that the urgent measures called for are not new, but rather interventions that are a standard part of traffic management toolkit, what measures have Dorset Council already put in place in response to the government's call for action? And by when do they anticipate having spent the money made available by the government? Chairman, I believe the response will come from Councillor Ray Bryan, portfolio holder uh, for highways, travel and the environment. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes, uh, thank you, Penny Quilter, for the question. The announcement on the 4th of June confirmed an indicative allocation of 115,000 for the short term and an additional 462,000 for medium term or permanent measures. 
This was not a formal allocation and Dorset Council have been working hard to both deliver on some essential schemes and prepare bid documents for the government to secure a formal allocation of money to deliver them. The first stage was intended for relatively small scale quick wins and a submission was made to government on the 4th of June for this money. The formal allocation of this phrase one money was only given on the 25th of June and it has not yet been received. Thanks to the hard work of our officers, the final allocation for phase one is 128,000 and in excess of the indicative 115,000. Despite this money not having been received, uh, having been formally secured until the 25th of June, Dorset Council has been delivering necessary schemes effectively at risk throughout June. These include the High Street and East Street in Wimborne, where we've been doing footway widening, the High Street in Shaftesbury, where we've introduced part-time closures, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Sorry about my age, showing the, the old times, for social distancing and public realm in, improvement. In West Bay Bridge, West Bay Bridge, Bridport, the footway widening and bus stop move for space for queuing at food kiosks. Salisbury Street, Blandford, footway widening into the carriageway. Market Cross, Sturminster, Newton, parking removed for sitting out space. The Esplanade, Weymouth, footway widening using King's Statue bus stop at, uh, as, at pinch point. Other schemes are in process of planning or delivery. In, in, in Bemster, Dorchester, Gillingham, Lyme Regis, Sherborne, Swanage and Wareham, other steps have been examined in detail in Weymouth. In addition, stencil kits to support social distancing have been sent to all town councils and are being used by Dorset Council teams in key locations, including bus stops and high priority locations. Dorset Council will have eight weeks to spend the phase one money allocated from the date of receipt. The government are asking for submissions for the phase two element of funding, although we have not yet been given details for this submission by the, DF, the DFT. It is intended that these schemes are larger, semi-permanent or permanent schemes, and the bid may have to be accompanied by business case and cost benefit analysis, depending on the scheme. Tranche two is focused towards a green reset and providing additional schemes for promoting increased walking and cycling. <clears throat> this funding is also prioritised in areas where there were previously high levels of public transport use, which in Dorset includes Weymouth, Dorchester and areas of South East Dorset. Although we are also investigating schemes elsewhere, the additional scale, complexity and cost of these schemes, as well as the need for local consultation, means that the delivery timescale will be longer. Whilst we have an indicative allowance for tranche two, we do not yet know when the Department for Transport will formally request submissions or when the subsequent allocation these funds will be. Dorset Council will encourage residents who have specific social distancing or active travel proposals to add them to the Dorset, Dorset Safe Streets web page in order that it can be considered alongside other proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, we've now got a question from John Colvert, and I think uh, Matt's going to read it. I will do indeed, Chairman. So as an interested <coughs> resident of the Dorset Council area, I waited until the agenda for the Cabinet meeting of June 30th appeared on ModGov on Tuesday the 23rd of June, then looked for details. There were no papers on Tuesday the 23rd of June, but they appeared on ModGov on Wednesday the 24th of June, i.e. today. I was astonished to see that questions had to be submitted by 8.30 on Thursday the 25th of June. I should clarify that's 8.30 a.m. Can the Leader of the Council explain how constructive questions can be raised by the public with less than 24 hours to scan a document with over 200 pages, 250 pages. Surely the process can be better planned to give members of the public more time to read, at least those areas which interest them. Thank you, thank you Matt. And thank you very much, uh, John Culver, for the question. Uh, cabinet agendas are published online eight calendar days before the date of the meeting. We also publish a forward plan of the Cabinet intended business a month in advance so that people know ahead of time what issues will be decided on at, at, at any particular meeting. I'm sorry that the questioner could not find the agenda for today's meeting. 
The agenda was published and it was available online on Monday the 22nd of June and not Wednesday the 24th of June. And I noticed that we have five questions or statements to the cabinet today. Thank you very much. Um, we now move on to a question from Avril Simmons, and I believe Jonathan will read that question. Uh, Chairman, is it possible to fine offenders, at least for the cost of call outs, where firefighters and the police are called out to ex extinguish barbecues and campfires? If people are from out of the area, then can their details be verified through their vehicle number plates? Chairman, I believe that the portfolio holder for highways, travel and environment will answer. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes, thank you. Um, I thank Avril Simmons for her question. We were all very distressed by the recent scenes from Wareham Forest and by similar events in other areas of Dorset. These incidents appear to be coming more frequent and the council must do what it can to prevent them. Our thanks go to the emergency services, landowners, council staff and members of the public who responded to limit the damage to our environment and risk to life and property. There is a report on our agenda later today outlining our early thoughts on what more the council can do in conjunction with other partners. I fully support this work and will ensure that your suggestions are considered and that a detailed report with recommendations is brought back here as <coughs> soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. We've now got a statement from Annabel Gardner and I believe Matt's going to read it. Thank you, Chairman. So statement from Annabel Gardner. I'm in favour of the prohibition of disposable barbecues, but there needs to, needs to be some serious fines to deter people from using them in public spaces especially high fire risk areas. Not only do carelessly discarded disposable barbecues cause fires, callously displaced ones, e.g. buried under the sand, cause horrific injuries, usually sustained by a child, and there is an attached photo that we're not displaying. I'm also in favour of asking all retailers to become responsible, withdraw sales of disposable barbecues. This approach has been started through the nationwide campaign, Leave the Barbecue at Home. The aim of this campaign is to encourage and persuade retailers, local and national, to voluntarily remove these items from sale. Whilst I appreciate that this approach may be drawn out over a long period, e.g. the supermarkets, put, supermarkets putting profit before the environment, we need to persevere with putting pressure on retailers until these disposable barbecues are withdrawn from sale. In the meantime, another option could be for the retailers to increase the price of disposable barbecues with a significant percentage going towards the fire and rescue service and the landowner's cost for restoration. And there is a link for below the, uh, for a campaign. Thank you very Thank much, you very much. Uh, Matt. Matt. Right, um, we move on to agenda item five now, which is written questions from members. And there's three members that have asked questions, um, John Oral, uh, Jill Taylor and, and Brian Heatley. So, and I'll invite them in order. John, would you like to come and um, present your question, please? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I'll skip the preamble, if you like, because you can read that. And um, I go straight to the question. Uh, can we have a firm date in July by which persons, only persons with a genuine link to Weymouth will remain in the Richmore and Monomy and Riviera hotels? And assuming I don't get a, a firm date on that one, can the council immediately use its existing estate and identify buildings that can rapidly convert, be converted to hostel use with the same speed and rigour as was shown by those who built the Nightingale hospitals so they are ready by August? Thank you, John. Graham Carr Jones, I think you're going to reply. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, John, for your question. Um, I think in answering this question, I think it's useful for me to <coughs> provide some context. Uh, the, the Homeless Reduction Act of 2017 places a legal duty on local authorities so that everyone who is homeless or at risk of homelessness will have access to meaningful help, irrespective of their priority need status, as long as they are eligible for assistance. Under the Homelessness Reduction Act, everyone in a local housing authority's district should be able to access free information and, and advice on preventing homelessness, securing accommodation when homeless, the rights of people who are homeless or threatened with homelessness, and the duties of the authority. Any help that is available from the authority or anyone else and how to access that help. 
Dorset Council is the housing authority and has to treat everyone coming into the council for support from Dorset and will establish a local connection to Dorset. It cannot take into account which part of Dorset the person is from, although it does need to consider what support a person would have from friends and family in their local community. It is not legally possible to restrict the placement of a homeless household to a particular town, but where possible, this is always the preferred option if following discussions with the individual, a preference is specified. However, a shortage of suitable temporary accommodation in Dorset does limit the options available to the council. It should be noted that if a person is accepted to join the housing register, currently they have to be nominated to a former district or borough area as the old system from the legacy council days is still in operation. Going forward, once the new housing allocations policy is adopted, restriction to an area may not apply as it is proposed that there will be one single Dorset connection rather than to the former district or borough. The council has now secured the use of a hostel in Purbeck area and a number of the people are and will be moving across to this accommodation, particularly those that have identified a link to East Dorset, sorry, the east of Dorset. Therefore, it's not possible to give a specific date uh, to the question, as legally the council cannot do what is required. So in response to your further question, uh, John, uh, officers from the property services are looking at the existing estate to see if there are any opportunities to convert something to a hostel. Any potential site identified would need to meet building regulations and planning criteria, but everyone is aware speed is of the essence in identifying alternative accommodation solutions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Graham. Jill Taylor. Jill Taylor. Oh, no, Jill. There you are. Um, thank you very much. My, my question is very much along the same lines as Councillor Orell. Um, would the portfolio for housing and community safety agree that the COVID pandemic has shone a light on the homeless problems in Dorset? It is a disgrace that in the 21st century, we have over 300 individuals and families who are in temporary accommodation. And I appreciate that that number has now dropped a little. However, I'm sure this is an underestimate of the people that, that we need to support. COVID, however, has given us an opportunity to change this and to have positive outcomes, but it needs the council to take and own the, the issue, not just those of the rough sleepers. These are our residents. They are not imported from elsewhere. They are all individuals and they all have stories that have led them to be in this situation. They should be treated with respect. And if I can just say what John Bird said in the Times at the weekend, we cannot just treat the homeless as non-citizens or another species. Would the portfolio holder for housing and community safety propose positive steps in a timely manner to increase permanently our temporary housing provision and also the support that is needed to enable tenants to retain tenancies? Can I have assurances that this council is investing in increasing in the amount of temporary housing and are actively seeking grant funding from government to help us take these residents permanently off the streets? In addition to this, and in a review of the housing allocation policy, can he consider how social housing can be used to provide more accommodation for homeless people? Although in this, I'm mindful in the need to still provide housing for those who are not adequately housed. This virus shines a light on how many additional properties we need in Dorset, just to house our residents. <coughs> We hear time and time again from residents that we don't need any more housing in Dorset, that we have enough. This is appalling. It's unacceptable and is usually from residents who have a roof over their heads. Would the portfolio holder for planning ensure that the planning authority listens to the need and gives due weight to the silent majority, those who do not have a roof over their heads? 
These residents do not attend our planning meetings or bombard councillors with emails, but they are still our residents and are equal to all other residents. We need to build our way out of this mess and planners and the planning committees need to take note of the needs of all our residents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. I, I think we're going to start with uh, David Walsh to deal with the first part of the question, which is related to housing, and then we'll come back to Graham. I think it's the other way around, is Jim. It? OK, I well think then. It's, it's me first, because... Uh, OK. Councillor Jill Taylor, I thank you for the question, and it's it's you're, you're right. Um, I do agree with you. This this pandemic has shone a light on on the the, the work of the housing team and what's needed. But the council is working in partnership with a number of agencies, such as Citizens Advice, to ensure there is advice and information available to those who are concerned about paying their rent and losing their tenancy. This includes signposting advice to benefit support and credit unions and trading standards advice about avoiding loan sharks. I've done, oh God. Uh, we're also engaging with the private sector landlords to remind them of their legal responsibilities regarding eviction proceedings and asking them to contact us if they have concerns about a tenant so everybody can work together to prevent a household becoming homeless. The drive to increase the amount of properties for use as temporary accommodation remains a key priority for the housing team. The council offer a private sector lettings management service and any landlord with a property can lease their property directly to the council for them to manage on their behalf. We are working on promoting this scheme in order to secure more properties for use as temporary accommodation. And following the announcement on the 21st, uh, 24th of June that the government is providing a further 105 million to support local authorities, ensuring that people currently accommodated in emergency accommodation do not return to the streets. Officers will be working with colleagues from the MHCLG and to prepare a number of bids to increase the accommodation options for homeless households, such as supported housing and hostels. Discussions have taken place with our three main registered housing providers and they have offered to directly let a number of properties to the council for use as temporary accommodation. This does however mean that for every property offered, one less is av available for social rented opportunities. So there's a fine balance to be struck. However, the council can let rooms individually as a house share, which an RP cannot do. In the light of the high numbers of accommodated in bed and breakfast accommodation and to move people into longer term settled accommodation, any property advertised on Dorset Home cho Choice will take priority for housing in the short term. This will include anyone in hospital who cannot return home and anyone in a refuge. It should be noted, however, that although priority is given to those in temporary accommodation, this does not include those properties with a Section 106 or a Rural Connection criteria in place. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, David Walsh, do you want to add anything to Graham's response? Yes, please. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Jill for your question and allowing me to sing from the same hymn sheet. Your concern that the local planning authority takes account of housing needs across all sections of our community is noted and indeed fully shared. I can offer my assurance that work is currently underway to determine the amount, type and location of homes that will be required to meet Dorset's needs now and in the future as part of the emerging Dorset local plan. This includes affordability of housing to ensure that a broad range of needs are met across Dorset. The plan is targeted for adoption in 2023, but in the meantime, planning officers continue to seek a mix of housing types and affordability in accordance with existing adopted development plan policies. I would add that planning has to have regard for all material considerations, and this will include the objectively assessed housing needs of all of our community. Ultimately, planning judgments should not be swayed by the volume of representations but rather the relevance of the issues that are raised. 
and the evidence of need that exists. And your officers will continue to advise accordingly. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, David. We've got uh, now we've got Brian Heatley. Brian, we'd like to present your question, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my question begins with a table of figures, and I am, I'm not going to solemnly read out a table of figures. Uh, what the table does is compare the financial impact of COVID on the finances of, th of Dorset Council and two neighbouring councils, uh, BCP, that's Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul and Wiltshire. What we look at is the difference between what uh, COVID is costing those councils, both in extra activities and in lost revenue, with and we take away from that the money we've received from central government and that creates a funding gap for each council. How long you can sustain a funding gap in part depends on what your reserves are and so the final part of the calculation is to compare the funding gap with the reserves. If you look at that for the three councils, um, BCP are expecting to spend, and these are all estimates of course, twice their reserves, Wiltshire three times their reserves, and if you look at Dorset, it's about one and a half on the current figures, but on the other hand, we seem to be assuming that the COVID emergency will last less time than then, them, so we're actually closer to them than might appear. Now, both those other two councils uh, have some sort of plan for thinking about what they're going to do about this. Um, Bournemouth BCP will be taking uh, a budget mitigation strategy to their full council in July. Uh, Wiltshire have talked in terms of a potential unbudget, unbalanced budget situation that will have to be mitigated somehow. My question is this. Uh, shouldn't we too be facing up rather more explicitly to the situation where our budget has become unbalanced and is under threat? Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Tony Ferrari. Um, Brian, can I thank you for your question? I must say I always look forward to them. Nobody else sends me questions with spreadsheets in them. It's great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question illustrates only too clearly the difficulty in planning in a world where so little certainty about the future. Your first point's about peer comparisons. Our position is clearly better than many in our peer group. We did enter the pandemic in better financial shape than many other unitaries. Your second concern was the period we used for modelling our recovery. The end point of COVID-19's impact will not be a sudden step back to normality. At either four or six months, there'll be a progressive and inconsistent recovery, which we're clearly already seeing take place. Some recovery will be faster than four months. We're already collecting some car parking income, for example. Some will take longer than six. We anticipate a long recovery in council tax and business rates before they reach pre-COVID levels. Overall, we're comfortable that the four month we've used for modelling gives us a position that reasonably represents the challenge we are facing. Having said that, we are taking steps to mitigate the financial position. We're cutting expenditure wherever possible. For example, we've got notice on Allen View House and Princess Street buildings. We've more rigorously considered the allocated reserves, particularly those inherited from predecessor councils. This will make them available even more general reserve. We've curtailed the current capital programme. We're still making tactical investments, but we no longer believe that the sorts of substantive projects we will be we were considering will be the priority for a post COVID-19 administration. We've immediately started work on what will emerge as the 21-22 capital programme part of the budget exercise. We're also still vigorously addressing government, both via our MPs and the various councillor networks to ensure the reality of local government finance is understood in Westminster. But none of these approaches will fix the problem. The 21-22 budget will be very different from that which we had anticipated at the beginning of the year. But we do not believe that a precipitate action is necessary and we can manage the undoubtedly uncomfortable future using our normal business processes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony.
That's the end of written questions from members. We move on to agenda item six now, which is the uh, forward plan. And as colleagues will have heard me say many times that it's an iterative process and it is one where we set out the business of our of the cabinet going forward. Um, and I'm aware that um, I know Peter Wharf wants to uh, mention an item which isn't on the forward plan, but needs to be. Peter, do you want to come in at this point? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Peter Wharf, Deputy Leader. Uh, also part of my cabinet responsibilities for human resources and staff. Um, we were due to present the people strategy to the, the progress on the people strategy to this cabinet and we delayed it in order to give the opportunity for the resources uh, scrutiny committee to review the progress report we were about to submit before we brought it to cabinet because that is always the best way around so it is i'm now suggesting that it should come to the end of july cabinet although through you chair if the chairman of that scrutiny committee is online I'd be grateful if he could confirm if it is going in front of his scrutiny committee in the next few weeks. So a change to the forward plan to include a review of the people's strategy at the end of July, which will be a review of the plan that we developed pre-COVID and it will also review post-COVID how we've responded to the various events that have made us a change course slightly whilst keeping the general strategy the same. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Peter. Is Piers Brown on the line? If, if not, we'll we, we'll pick him up beyond the meeting. Did I hear you there, Piers? No. Well, we'll we'll, pick, we'll have a conversation with Piers outside the meeting then. Um, I'm aware there's a bit of tidying up needed as well on the uh, uh, forward plan. I'll be having a conversation with uh, Democratic uh, as well. So the next version will look a little different from the one we got now. But I said it is iterative. So we're happy to uh, to 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 note the uh, forward plan, colleagues. Yep. Thank you very much. We go Agreed. on to agenda item seven now. Well, there's two items, seven and eight, and they're both related to uh, COVID-19. Um, and I'm going to suggest that, and obviously I can either have this conversation outside the meeting or might get a, a, a signal from the two scrutiny, current scrutiny chairs that both reports could be forwarded to resources and, and people's overview scrutinies um, to, for action as they see appropriate. But that's for them to judge. Uh, but the main thing this morning really is to, uh, for me to deal with, I'm going to deal with um, agenda item seven um, as leader. Um, and there is a, a note on my papers that there was a, a typo in the original uh, report it left the word not out, which um, these things happen on occasions that's been corrected. But um, so I'm going to sort of do a brief introduction around the executive summary and then I'm going to invite cabinet colleagues um, who and they are aware of this to uh, make a contribution about the areas that, uh, that relate to their own particular portfolios. I thought that was more appropriate because they're closer to the detail than I am and I think that adds value to this is a, a report to be noted but it's an important one we had a similar report this is a progress report on where we are with the, our work around the COVID emergency as you all know we have one on here on the 5th of May um, and this is really a, an update so for me I'm going to dwell not too long on the executive summary and and, and sadly talk about the um, the number of fatalities and infections uh, in the time we we, can, we are on record of saying that uh, actually in Dorset we've had a remarkably low level of infections and deaths but every death is one too many um, so we're dealing with that compared to the rest of the country that is um, but um, yeah we'd lost at the time we did the report which is the 4th of June we'd lost 279 people across Dorset and Bournemouth so combination of the two uh, unitary councils areas um, including those that died in care homes and so on in hosp hospital settings. Um, obviously a tragic loss and our thoughts are clearly with the families of those who've lost, lost loved ones. So, uh, but the the, um, the initial uh, Dorset Council response to COVID was detailed, as I said in a report on the 5th of May, and it set out the services provided to support residents and businesses during the period of lockdown from the 23rd of March to the 20th of April. And obviously this report takes us forward until uh, the 4th of June. Um, along with emerging um, you know, arrangements for recovery planning and future reset uh, of the organisation and so on. So I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to stop at this point and I'm going to invite um, 
and the first speaker, which is Laura Miller. Spencer, 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 you've got uh, Councillor Daryl Turner, chairman of the place scrutiny, who has put right to speak up. Well, he can I, speak at the end of the pres okay, he's presenting fine. the report, Peter. Yeah. And at the end, I'll let Daryl come in okay. and comment on, on the report as presented. Fine. So thank you very much for that. Though. Laura Miller. Item nine to nine point nine point one to nine point five six, I think, if I remember rightly. Laura. Thank you, Chair. Yes, that's right. I think there's um, there's a couple of bits in there that I'd just like to touch on. Um, I haven't prepared anything. I just wanted to really walk through um, this part, the health um, and adults part, really, of this report. Um, just to also mention that Tony Meadows, who's the head of um, commissioning at Dorset <coughs> Council, is also on the call. I think he got missed out. Um, at the beginning of the roll call, um, but he's here if we have any specific questions on the detail, um, particularly around care homes um, and PPE and things like that. So at 9.1, you see that there's reference and a, a bit of a detail on the public health um, the test and trace. So we've been working very closely with our public health team, with Sam Crow, the director, to support the two um, initiatives. So we've got the test and trace initiative, which is the national contract tracing um, service that's gone live on the 28th of May. This is the main way that everyone orders a test. So we're really looking um, to, to continue that close relationship with, with the public health um, and to work on the um, local outbreak management plan. Um, now, it's important to say about the local outbreak management plan that um, all councils, as it says in 9.4, responsible for public health and social care, which is us, um, have to develop a local outbreak management plan. And that's fine. We can do that. Um, we can uh, work out how we address that in schools. If we have a local outbreak, uh, care homes, um, high risk settings, all of the, the places um, that, that, that we look after, that we're aware of. Um, and we do have money uh, to support that. But what's also very important and what I just wanted to draw out was that Dorset Council is going to use the Health and Wellbeing Board um, to do this. And this is really important for me because Health and Wellbeing Boards um, sometimes aren't, not, not that they're not as visible to residents as we would like them to be, but perhaps not as accessible and maybe residents and the public don't sort of understand the full role of the health and wellbeing board and so we're going to use the health and wellbeing board to, to really provide that assurance to to the public and to residents that you know that we're on this that we're developing that plan and we can respond really quickly um, so i think that's very important um, with regards to um, recovery and and how we how we go forward, I think it's very important to remember that um, a lot of the work that we had started doing, like for example, um, building based day care as opposed to offering residents day opportunities, a lot of that work had already started, and that's the direction that we wanted to go in. Um, and it's very much a sort of national direction, but it's something that we feel very passionately about in Dorset. You know, some people will require day care, uh, but most people would would appreciate day opportunities um, individually tailored. And that's what we were looking to do. And that's what COVID has sort of really hastened is, is that kind of move to more person centred, more opportunity centred. And we don't want to lose that. So um, as we said in, in 9.5, um, you know, it's, it's really important to, to that we learn lessons to inform our recovery, um, you know, and, and, and we really want to look at that. Now, I don't know if you want me to sort of carry on and talk a bit more about the social care and infection spread um, and go on to sort of nine point whatever it is. Yeah, go up um, to nine point five six. Any comments you want to make? OK, thank you. Um, Right, let's go back and have a look. Where did I get to? I was scrolling through. Brilliant. So, yeah, social care. Um, and, and that really was what I was just talking about. It's how we get, how we've given our residents the best possible care. And we recognise that it's not ideal. A lot of people with learning disabilities or mental health problems um, have been accessing place based, um, you know, setting based care. And we've worked very hard. Um, all of those people that are open to us receive regular contact, one on one contact. Um, might be my phone, might be virtually, um, but we're very much um, aware of that and we need to continue that support. So on to where are we? 9.8. Um, we're looking at um, local interventions. We had a re request from the Minister of State for Care um, that we could provide assurance um, around what we've done 
to support our residential care homes and that's really important because we're all aware of what's been going on in the news and what's been going on nationally it's become a huge issue um, that you know people who are in care homes uh, by the very fact that they're in care homes they are going to be more vulnerable um, to this horrible virus and we really have to you know have had to and continue to step up um, the protection so the detail is in there um, we, we were awarded the infection control fund um, it's we manage it as a grant 75% um, of funding allocated to all CQC registered care homes residential care homes and that's based on their beds how many beds they've got and the remaining 25% um, will be allocated to other care settings but we're going to work very much in partnership with all our care providers to see how we use that Controlling the spread of infection, moving on to the next section, just to touch on this briefly, um, we actually set up an emergency PPE drive through system so that they uh, care providers could access that seven days a week. We also delivered if they couldn't get um, to us. So I think we can chalk that up as a success because we, we worked so hard with our care providers to make sure that they had PPE supplies. And I think that's really, really important. Also, again, with our public health colleagues, um, the guidance um, around how to use PPE in different settings, and that includes obviously the care centre. We've now uh, had from the CCG a clear flowchart for all providers on how they access PPE. Um, so I think that is incredibly helpful. Um, thank you, CCG. And it's important to say that to date, no care provider in our Dorset Council area has run out of PPE. Um, and I'm really proud of our teams for that. Um, it goes on the report to talk about um, additional infection control training and um, online booking portals for testing. You, you can all read the report, report, but I think what I wanted to highlight was, you know, the amount of work that's been done. We have been supporting our workforce. Um, we've got a free counselling service. I can't stress enough how important that is. Um, online training resources, especially for new staff. And of course, we have had a lot of new staff simply because of the economic situation and people are looking for jobs and also because we need them. Um, so we've we've taken some steps to support our care providers. We're aware it's an incredibly tough time, not just for local authorities, but for the people that we work with. We pay um, immediately um, when they invoice us. Uh, we consider additional support where they have cost pressures over the additional uplift of 10%. Um, emergency PPE has been free um, and we're we're really in touch with them very, very regularly. Um, so we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to look at what funding they need um, in the future. And just briefly, if I may, to skip to um, adult mental health, safeguarding concerns are, are usual or at normal level, but our mental health um, assessments have, have rose, have risen, sorry, rose, risen. Um, and, you know, we, we, we're not sure of the reason for that, but we do have weekly reports and we are on top of it and we're aware of it. And this is something that, you know, we're really going to have to focus on because um, mental health is going to be a huge challenge after this period. Um, so um, I don't know again. Yes, you said to 9.5. Fine. OK, um, the report. Yes, that's what I want to talk about as well. Um, was our shielding work with the VCS, the voluntary community and social enterprise sector. Um, I can't I can't say thank you enough to, to those people in the VCS. Um, and we are um, continuing to co-produce um, support um, ideas, uh, policy with the VCS. That's something that I feel really, really passionately about. The work that you can see that has been undertaken in this section of the report really goes into some detail about volunteer capacity, how we've worked, what we've done. Um, there's some numbers in there um, and on to the community shield work as well. Um, kind of the same thing, um, but uh, really important just to stress how Dorset as um, an area. <coughs> sorry, my dog's barking. How Dorset as an area, along with our volunteer partners, I'm just going to shut the door. Right. That was very professional. Um, but just to say how Dorset as an area has come together with all our volunteer partners. Um, you can see the detail in the report. You can see the volume of inquiries that we have, the people that we've supported um, who have been shielded. And the bit that I really wanted to pick up was 9.55. Community has been essential to Dorset's response to shielded people. That's the key takeaway that we should all be taking away from this. 
Anyway, um, I've waffled for far too long and my dogs are barking and I do apologise, but such is the joy of working from home virtually. Um, thank you for your time and your patience and um, I commend my section of the report, really. We'll now hand over to Andrew Parry. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Laura, as well. Um, in, I'd, I'd certainly like to uh, endorse the parts of the report that are set out uh, in respect of children and education. Uh, there was certainly the early decision to encourage our schools to work in a cluster formation. And this ensured that our schools did remain open throughout the, the period of COVID lockdown and continue to do so today. Uh, for the benefit uh, of our key worker children and our children who are special educational needs and those we would identify as being vulnerable in some other respect. But it was also the opportunity to ensure that a, uh, a lesson plan was delivered for children who were working uh, from home. Uh, and this has been very successful is my understanding of it. And uh, we, we really are very grateful to the schools and their leadership teams for everything they've done to ensure uh, that an education setting as best as possibly could be provided provided the children across Dorset. The majority of Dorset's early year settings uh, have opened since early June with support from the council uh, and we are providing daily advice to them. Where there are individual cases that are showing some difficulty and they're being flagged up with us, we are dealing with them on a case by case basis to try and find ways of resolving them. Uh, we've been working with the school leaderships and focusing on how things like free school meals could be delivered and how the help for vulnerable children uh, and those that are going to require support from the school in terms of its pastoral settings as well as academic settings can be achieved. Uh, particularly as the lockdown measures are, are being eased and more of our children are going to return to a school a classroom setting. We know, for example, the government has announced that all pupils will return to a classroom setting from September. As the report states, reception classes year one and year six have already returned and extensive planning and risk assessments were undertaken and continue to be updated. There's also going to be uh, our secondary schools have returned. We understand that years 10 and 12 are receiving some face to face sessions with their teachers before the end of the summer term. I welcome the report's acknowledgement that throughout the COVID lockdown, Dorset Council has continued to focus on safeguarding with our social worker teams maintaining contact, including managed visits in person when necessary with children and families. You will have noted as anticipated that the number of children in care has increased during the period, which is a pattern that we've seen nationwide. This was inevitable and has caused a pressure on finding foster placements and in particular acute and secure placements for highly vulnerable individuals. Cabinet will be aware of our ambition to recruit more in-county foster carers. This essential work has continued throughout the lockdown period. Uh, and regular updates on the progress of this will be reported back by the Corporate Parenting Board. Can I use this opportunity to record my grateful thanks to everyone who has been working to keep our children and young people safe during the COVID-19 lockdown, including the children and young people themselves, who have had to contend with some very unsettling circumstances of which they could not possibly have envisaged a few months ago. Uh, Chairman, I would now like to pass over to Councillor Ray Bryan. Hello, Ray. Yeah, just getting it right. Um, during the last few weeks, we have seen, uh, we have experienced above average sunshine and temperatures. This has brought out the crowds as we saw in the BCP area last week people not taking sufficient care and a lack of consideration to others. Within the Dorset Council's area, we have seen extra people visiting our lovely coastline and beautiful countryside areas. Our leader wrote to the Prime Minister highlighting the potential problems we faced. We have seen some very poor be public behaviour by a minority, and this has resulted in Dorset Council staff and Dorset councillors facing abuse and on some occasions potential physical harm. Car parks are open and have been full and yet we are blamed for not providing enough spaces for motorists coming from all over the country. They have descended on Dorset in numbers not normally seen and decided to park 
wherever they saw fit. We have a paper on the cabinet agenda on the subject of portable barbecues and their consequences, if not discarded safely. The tragedy of Wareham forest fire would take years to recover and again, due to the public lack of consideration for others, the fire service had to face a very dangerous situation. Fires do damage to both the climate and ecological future of Dorset. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank both the officers and our comms team for all the energy they have put in to try and resolve the problems that we are faced by large numbers visiting Dorset. I will now pass over to Councillor Gary Suttle. Uh, thank you, Ray. Um, well, I'm going to concentrate on the grants in uh, 9.77. And uh, as you'll see, the information is all there. Uh, 8,450 grants, 100 million uh, uh, distributed. I don't think what it doesn't say is that Dorset received the fifth largest amount of money uh, in the UK and for a small team and small authority to distribute uh, this amount of money has been a magnificent achievement. I don't think uh, anyone can say thank you enough for getting this money out. Uh, to, as you know, it's been absolutely needed by business and uh, I believe that we have really uh, a significant achievement there. Still a bit to go um, and we are trying to make certain that anybody who hasn't yet applied is aware and can apply so the grant remains open. On the 9.78 we move to a completely different grant where some who couldn't access the original grant and we are talking small business still with a little bit of discretion um, we were allowed only £6 million pounds and we got 2,126 uh, applications. So you can see that if you want to try a sort of pro rata scheme, £30 million pounds should have been available for that. But all we got was six. Um, and that meant that we distributed a lower level of grant to the majority of people who applied. However, had we not, they would have received nothing at all. And I think it's, this is a significant grant for, for those who really did miss out in the first one, particularly in marine, for b and B's, for a number of trades and for no fault of their own. And um, there is still a group of people who have not benefited from the grants or any of the other measures that the government has put in place. It's extremely vexing if you're in business and you haven't been able to access it. But I will say that we've had um, a number of very relieved emails from the discretionary grants uh, thanking us. We've also received uh, some where, who have still been able to access who are unsuccessful and uh, we still have the opportunity of lob lobbying government and I believe there is a national group as well lobbying government to try and get more money here for those who have so far failed. Once again, I'd like to stress what an achievement it's been for the team at uh, Dorset Council. Particular thanks to Mark Payne, who really put in the extra hour, to David Walsh, who worked over the weekend to make certain we got this out. All of the money's gone. It's all out there. I think we have a tiny a wash up meeting with a tiny little fund for anybody who who didn't get it and might have been missed through no fault of their own. So there is just a little, little amount left. Um, but to put it into context, Southampton only opened for applications last week and we've already finished and uh, we're well ahead of BCP as well. So my thanks to everybody who's been involved in these grants. I know so many of you have contacted me. I know there are a number of disappointed people still out there, um, but we will continue to lobby and we'll do our best. Thank you. We now hand over to uh, Tony Ferrari. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, the section about the financial implications for the councils based on our response to the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. It's a fairly well aired position. Our budget gap is £60 million. The money we've received so far from central government is 21.1. Well, Ed, we still continue to lobby strongly and seek more money from central government. Um, 
updates will come through as and when that happens. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I'll hand over to uh, Peter Wharf now, please. Thank you, thank you Chairman. Uh, I'm looking at the items on the report. Item 10, recovery strategy and plan. Item 11, organisational reset. And item 12, transformation. Uh, and <clears throat> first of all, I want to talk about what recovery is because we have to follow the national guidance in this and it relates to any major emergency which is responded to under the Civil Contingencies Act 2004 such as severe flooding, a major fire or as in this case an epidemic, the COVID-19 epidemic. The national guidance defines recovery as a process of rebuilding, restoring and rehabilitating following an emergency and the guidance sets out how that is to be achieved, stating that recovery is an enabling and supportive process which allows individuals, families and communities to attain a proper level of functioning through the provision of information, specialist services and resources. And it is normally expected that the recovery process is led by what's called the Local Resilience Forum, LRF, which is a multi-agency body which will oversee both the response to and the recovery from the emergency. It is convention that the local councils will take the lead role for this recovery, in our case, Dorset Council and BCP Council. The LRF has established a recovery coordinating group and this is chaired by John Selgren, the executive director of a place within Dorset Council. The LRF has prepared a recovery strategic plan and this has provided a framework for, the reco for, for recovery across Dorset. Within Dorset Council, we've prepared a recovery plan for the council services set within the context of the LRF plan. And this process has been led by the Recovery and Reset Executive Advisory Panel, panel under my chairmanship. The panel has already met twice at speed and at our first meeting, we met in a workshop firm format and using the same methodology as the LRF, undertook a review to identify those aspects of the council's functions which had been adversely impacted by the epidemic. In addition, we identified those positive things such as the move to more agile working, greater partnership working and community volunteering, which have had uh, incredibly beneficial outcomes and we wish to see sustained. These that we are calling the reset elements. <clears throat> Obviously there will be other resets where we reduce or change our services. We've used the framework of the adopted council plan to identify a list of specific things which we need to ensure are addressed over the coming months to ensure that the council services which have been disrupted by the COVID-19 epidemic are restored where possible, as well as making sure we've gained positively from those things which have been beneficial. The Dorset Council COVID-19 recovery plan, which has fed down from the LRF, has been circulated to all members a couple of weeks ago. And at the second and subsequent meeting of the EAP, we discussed with portfolio holders and chief officers the plans through which we will ensure that the council recovers where it can from the impact of the epidemic. We have a number of further EAP meetings planned over the next few weeks where we will talk to other organisational sections within the council and without of the council to identify what we believe to be the understanding of, of what has happened and how we can recover and reset. It is my intention to keep all members informed of the progress of this work throughout and to that event uh, I invited all members to observe the last EAP on recovery and reset and we had a number of members uh, and I've talked to a number of them and they were all uh, quite positive about the EAP and how much it contributed and I restate you are welcome to come as an observer if you're not on the EAP. Uh, the last item is transformation, which has had to take something of a back seat whilst we've been dealing with the epidemic, primarily because we have a worsening financial situation and we have a number of staff who were going to take part in transformational <coughs> activities that have been reallocated to, to other activities. Transformation has not stopped, but it has largely paused and we will be restarting it, but it may not be in the same form. That is the end of my report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Very helpful, all of you. Appreciate that. Now, before I go to the recommendation, I've got a, um, a three speakers, three councillors wish to speak. Brian Heatley, Nick Arland and Kate Weller, as well as Daryl Turner and, and David Took. So I'll take them in the order I've got. So, Brian, I, I also spotted, Brian, you had an RTS up. 
I want to supplement you to Tony Ferrari's response. Do you want to deal with that as well? Uh, that is what I basically wanted to do. Thanks. OK. Um, I was very grateful for Tony's reply. Uh, he set out what seemed to me to be the main elements that will have to be done to mitigate this this year's situation, uh, particularly cutting expenditure in some areas, perhaps some change to the capital programme, maybe some more things with reserves. Most of the rest seem to be about next year. Uh, it seems to me um, that this is a matter that will be of interest to some uh, to many members, particularly any reference to cutting expenditure. And Tony talked about the normal business processes. I, I'm kind of assuming that the normal business process will be the report on the first quarter that we get for next cabinet. Am I right in thinking that? Tony, do you want to pick that point up? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, the, the report for next quarter is a historical report, not a forward looking one. Um, what, what we do in that is just a report on the previous three months um, financial activity. Um, the the future is not yet clear and we and, and many of the things that you're seeking we haven't yet defined but I'm only too happy to have a more detailed conversation outside this new plans will emerge um, and if they need to go through appropriate processes they will um, but at the moment we're, we're at the stage of seeking what funding we're going to get from central government seeking what our overall financial position will be and seeking how we might address that so, but I'm very happy to have a conversation outside this as well. Thank you. OK, Brian. Yes, OK, thank you. Maybe we should. Yeah, OK. Nick Ireland. Thanks, Spencer. Um, I've got two questions. I'll, I'll probably read them both out and then um, for the, the two different portfolio holders. The first is to Tony Ferrari and the second is to Brian Heatley. Uh, not Brian, sorry, Ray Brian. I can't um, so um, the first one um, on page five of the report under the financial implica implications, um, it states that our shortfall is going to be as possibly as high as 39 million. Um, we don't know. And then on page 19, we learn that the budget gap is increasing by 15 million a, a month, uh, that we started the reserves with 28 million, and we're currently using that to prop up the financial situation, as already uh, Councillor Ferrari has already outlined. Um, in an email yesterday, I received from Aidan Dunn and Councillor Ferrari has already touched on this. Um, Aidan basically said they were going to take additional steps to um, find more funding sources, reduce um, spending, i.e. take our take leases off, um, Allendale, etc. Um, but he also stated that um, basically this would only postpone the requirement for a section 114 notice. So my question is actually a, a perfectly straightforward one. Assuming we don't have any more income from the government to, to get us out of this mess, what is the likely date we'll have to issue a section 114 notice? And so that's the first question. And the second one uh, is to Ray Bryan. He's sort of touched on it before, um, getting the papers at nine, two minutes past nine this morning for the um, public questions didn't really help to be honest. But um, so given the leeway and latitude that the government has given councils to rapidly create dedicated pop-up cycle lanes to protect cyclists from vehicular traffic and encourage residents to avoid both public transport and to stop them using cars, and has already successfully implemented by various other councils. How many successfully completed pop-up cycle lanes do we have? I suspect none. And how many are we planning and where are they? Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Can we start with uh, Tony Ferrari then, please? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, we have no planned timescale to issue a Section 114 notice. Um, what I think we should do is to send a more detailed response to you, Nick, uh, in writing to, to cover w why we think that's our position, but um, we have no date scheduled at this point. Can, can I also suggest, Tony, that all members of the council get to see that response sure. because it's sure. an important piece of data. Sure. Uh, Ray? Yes, um, uh, an interesting question. Uh, and unfortunately, it's one that without uh, notice, I haven't been able to prepare an answer. So I'll have to take the uh, uh, the position of going back to Councillor Nick Ireland and giving the details that he wants. It would be helpful if he would actually uh, let me have the written question and then I can respond correctly within the next 48 hours. 
Thank you, Ray. Um, Kate Weller. Kate Weller. We don't seem to have Kate Weller. I'll go on. I'll carry on. And if Kate appears, then we'll go back to her. So Daryl Turner. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good morning, Cabinet. I'm Daryl Turner on the um, Place Scrutiny Chair. Um, I'm referring to page um, 36 and 9.52. It's no chestnut, I'm afraid. There appears to be an extensive plan to use social media, as we're aware of. Um, and as good as that has been, there are many residents not online. I have mentioned this, you know, previously. Shouldn't we have had at least a second hard copy information sheet sent to our residents by now. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Daryl, you, you obviously didn't have to give us notice of the question. Can I take that away? I'll have a, I've got comms in my uh, portfolio. I'll take it away and have a conversation with um, the uh, manager and we'll get back to you on that one. OK, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, David Took. Thank you, Spencer. Um, first of all, I want to say a, a very well done to um, all of the local volunteers, Dorset Council. Um, they, they've, they've worked really hard, really well, and congratulations to them on that. However, there, there's been a concern over quite a while now that, that GDPR regulations may have prevented the sharing of data down to that local volunteer level. Um, perhaps meaning that some of our most vulnerable um, are falling between the cracks. I was in touch with John Whittingdale, who's the Minister for Data and Media, um, asking him that, and, and he very kindly uh, responded to me to say that um, under the exceptional circumstances of the coronavirus crisis, the usual data protection requirements should be relaxed. Uh, in fact, there's provisions in the uh, Data Protection Act to allow this and the Information Commissioner's Office has said that it will adopt a flexible approach. Um, so my question really is, are we confident now that given, given that this is the case, that all the volunteer groups are getting the information that they need without people not hiding behind, but perhaps being themselves shielded by or worried about GDPR as a, as a problem? Um, that's okay. basically my question. Th thank you, thank you, Dave. I'll ask uh, Laura Miller to come in on that, please. Thank you, Spencer. Um, yeah, I mean, there's two things there, um, David, isn't there? There's the um, your the second part of your question was around um, volunteer groups getting the data that they need, which is absolutely the case and and actually has been happening. Um, I've said before, I, I did a voluntary sector webinar and um, I had a very similar question actually it might have been from, I can't remember who it was from anyway um, and actually um, the question was can we be a hundred percent confident that we've reached everybody that needed to be reached um, and my answer which I'll give now was I can't be a hundred percent confident that we reached every single person that we that needed to be reached but I can be a hundred percent confident that we've a hundred percent tried now, we had a lot of um, contact from ward members saying, um, you know, I know my area, I know people, um, this GDPR in this in this instance is, you know, not appropriate because as a local ward member, I am best placed to give that advice. Now, I was on the fence for a long time about that and I went back to the government um, several times, as did officers, really quite forcefully saying, come on, we're in a pandemic, you know, this is ridiculous. But then it did, you know, we had we had conversations, um, they were very clear that we couldn't share that information with local ward members. And it did occur to me that um, we are political representatives. Uh, there may be people who don't want us to know their business. There may be people for, for political reasons or for personal reasons. But I am confident that the system with volunteers is working and was working. Um, so with regard to GDPR, it's a double edged sword, um, but I think we got there. 
Um, and again, if you want to um, contact me, you know, off this meeting and you want any further detail, then I'm always happy to provide it. Thank you very much for that, Laura. <clears throat> Thanks, OK, Laura. David, thank you. Right, we haven't got any other uh, speakers now. Um, can I just draw Cabinet's attention to the recommendation, which is to note the report? Uh, can we note, please? Can we all agree? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. We move on now to agenda item eight, uh, which is the COVID-19, how well the Dorset Council's response to meet the needs of the vulnerable groups during lockdown. And I'm, I believe, Peter, you're going to introduce this report. Uh I am, thank you, Chairman. I will be supported by a number of other people as we go through. Um, first of all, to explain this item is separate from the previous COVID update because of its significance to our residents and communities. Uh, and I am leading this in my capacity as um, Cabinet Member for Diversity and Inclusion. It has been developed under the auspices of the Community Shield Group, and I would like that group to continue to provide oversight as we move forward. Uh, members may well have seen recent news coverage which shows that black and minority ethnic communities are at a greater risk from COVID-19 than white communities are. And this has been partially reflected in the Black Lives Matter movement that has been sweeping parts of the world, triggered by the untimely death of George Floyd, but indicative of wider in inequalities that still exist across the world and in the UK in our society. I issued a press release recently saying that racism and all forms of discrimination have no place in Dorset and I've been working internally with officers to ensure equality impact assessments, EQIs, are completed and equality considerations are factored into all the relevant decisions we're taking. So I'm pleased to be presenting this report today and want to say a particular thank you to all the councillors who took part in the roundtable meetings that have contributed to its development. We had a wealth of really useful information, local initiatives, credit unions enabling access to cash, local businesses working together to provide free delivery services, parish and town councils helping to support the most vulnerable people in their community and a whole host others. And I, again, I thank local members. They really took their part to these roundtable meetings. I also want to flag that this report has a level of pre-scrutiny in the form of councillor roundtable meetings and with the agreement of the chair, Councillor Somper, it will be going to the People's Scrutiny Committee on the 20th of July. In addition, the EQI has been reviewed by the Equality and Diversity Action Group within the council and cited as a very in-depth piece of work. I will now hand over to the officers that have worked on this equality impact assessment, be, uh, beginning with Paul Ingledon, a consultant at Public Health Dorset, before moving on to Rupert Lloyd, a project coordinator at Public Health Dorset, and finally Susan Ward-Rice, our diversity and inclusion officer, before summarising myself. So first of all, I'd like to hand over to Paul Ingledon. Thank you, Councillor Wall, for the introductions. Um, just I'd like to mention first, I think it's worth emphasising that this is an initial assessment. As it says in the recommendations, we need to continue working together to maintain our focus on the impact of the pandemic on vulnerable people. I'll give a little bit by way of background as to how we undertook this initial assessment before handing over to colleagues. Uh, Rupert will describe the roundtable sessions that were held with councillors and Susan will then detail the recommendations. So the uh, assessment began life really in the mental health and safeguarding subgroup of the Community Shield, which was actioned to consider how well local vulnerable residents had been supported during lockdown. An initial list of vulnerable groups was identified through a desktop exercise uh, many thanks for to Rupert for beginning that work. Uh, and then the list was refined through discussion with the subgroup members. Uh, and uh, we then sort of joined forces, as it were, with Susan, who had separately started some work on an EQIA. Uh, the assessment template that you'll see in the papers by way of a spreadsheet was developed and colleagues were invited to consider how well they felt we had for each of the different identified groups, how well we'd informed them about the help that was available, 
responded to their requests for help and proactively reached out to ask them about ongoing needs. So there were three sort of areas of focus. We developed this uh, assessment tool through engagement with the subgroup, the mental health and safeguarding subgroup, through targeted conversations with key leads across the council and partners, and then through wider review with the Community Shield colleagues, and in parallel with that, an engagement exercise with the councillors that Councillor Wolf has mentioned, and Rupert will say shortly, uh, uh, will talk to him shortly. Uh, the assessment was really it was necessary that it was rapid and focused on the reflections of those that had been involved in providing the response. Um, in time we may well wish to extend this and consider the views of other stakeholders, staff perhaps and other vulnerable group members themselves. That said this initial assessment uh, gives a valuable start point for us and indeed the findings have influenced our early work in developing our local outbreak management plan. Uh, which Councillor Miller referred to earlier. So I very much echo Councillor Wolf's comments uh, around how useful it was to get feedback from councillors in our roundtable sessions. We heard about lots of town-based organisations responding to support residents. Uh, for example, Lime Forward, uh, the Swanage Town Council setting up a town charter, uh, Rendezvous in Blandford providing outreach services to young people and the Stourbridge volunteer group providing transport to local residents. Uh, the report that's been produced captures this incredible response from communities and volu vol voluntary groups, and many of those people who have, involved, who have been involved have expressed a desire to maintain that spirit and way of working collaboratively together. Um, our findings really fall into three broad categories. Uh, short term immediate actions that would need to be taken to address specific issues that were identified in terms of how the council responded. Um, second area where in more information will be needed to understand and indeed assess how well those groups have been supported. And then longer term actions relating to how we engage with and support particular groups of people in their ongoing needs. Um, so that's a brief overview from me and I'll hand over to Rupert uh, and now who will tell us more about the virtual roundtable discussions and then Susan will pick up on the recommendations. Thank you. Over to Rupert. Thank you Paul. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to give a very quick overview of those virtual roundtable sessions. Uh, which we held with councillors during May and June, um, and these were aimed at gathering their input on the developing EQIA and understanding uh, their insights into vulnerable groups in their wards. So we initiated those sessions um, after a meeting of the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion uh, Executive Advisory Panel chaired by Councillor Wharf. And after that first session, we then held six subsequent online roundtables for members across Dorset Council area. And these really had two uh, key aims. The first was to share with members the work that had been done on identifying vulnerable groups of people um, and how they've been supported during lockdown through the Community Shield effort. And then secondly, secondly we invited members to share their experience of the impact of COVID-19 and lockdown on their ward um, and collect their insights into which vulnerable groups they'd identified and how those people had been supported in uh, members individual wards and we used um, those insights to uh, inform the developing EQIA. Um, we've given a, a fuller summary of the outputs of those sessions in appendix two of the report to cabinet that accompanies EQIA but very briefly we wanted to give you a flavour of um, some of the key themes that emerged from those six sessions. So firstly um, members noted the hugely important role of the community and voluntary response um, across all wards in Dorset which has been mentioned already several times this morning and also the sense of strength and community spirit councillors have noticed across all wards. Um, we had uh, lots of examples of the impact of lockdown on people's mental well-being um, and groups that featured particularly prominently were people facing financial hardship 
and also uh, the mental impacts on the mental well-being of young people. And members expressed concern that some people who could have benefited from support that has been put in place haven't perhaps because they've been hard to reach in some way or have been reluctant to access support for a variety of reasons. And then um, finally, or the final key theme I wanted to share was uh, that um, there was widespread concern about people facing digital, digital exclusion. Um, and this included both people who struggle to access digital services for a variety of reasons, but also people who perhaps don't wish to access those services or would prefer other ways uh, to gain support. Um, and there is one more uh, key theme that I'd like to share today, which is that um, finally members were concerned that people have been put at increased risk of domestic violence during lockdown, um, including when victims have been unable to leave their homes um, and this has been hidden, um, but will start to emerge more going forward into the next weeks and months. So that's a, a very quick summary of what's um, set out in Appendix 2 of the report. I'm now going to hand over to Susan to say a bit more about the EQI itself. Thank you. OK, um, thank you, Rupert. Um, I'm going to focus on the recommendations which can be found in the action plan, um, which is section five of the equality impact assessment. So page 67 of the ModGov report. Um, as Paul has mentioned, the action plan is broken down into three categories. So the first category is about short term improvements. So no matter how accessible we think our information is, it will not meet everyone's needs. And for some people, we need to think about alternative formats such as easy read or use it or other languages, but also about working with key organisations to get those messages direct to the intended communities. So for example, working with People First Dorset or the Dorset Polish Centre. We also need to look at how we support colleagues who need to access translation and interpreting services and ensure that information is up to date and on the intranet. As both Paul and Rupert have mentioned, lots of good work has taken place within our communities and we need to capture some of that work through case studies and share that across Dorset Council area. Um, for other communities to learn and create similar opportunities in their local areas. And as for the final part of the short term improvements, as Councillor Wharf has stated in his introduction, black minority ethnic communities are at greater risk of COVID-19. The recent Public Health England report, which is cited in the EQIA, very much reinforces this. And we need to use this research to look at how we can improve our response to the needs of black minority ethnic communities in Dorset. Our second category in the action plan focused on whether council needs more information to inform how we'll work in the future as part of our recovery and reset. Work is already underway with citizens advised to understand what issues people with hearing and or visual impairments have faced during the lockdown and this will be done through a survey and focus groups. We also need to be engaging with a wide range of other communities, for example, our LGBTQ plus community, people with learning disabilities or, and or learning difficulties, and those who do not wish to or face barrier access, barriers accessing services digitally to find out what their experiences were like and what support they may require um, to inform our work in the future. Finally, our third category is more long term and using information collated from our actions in the second category. So, for example, using the results of the 2020 residents survey to address issues around digital exclusion and inclusion. These actions are a real opportunity for us at Dorset Council to understand more about our local communities, helping us not only to build a much stronger relationship with them, but also to help us deliver more efficient and effective services in the future. I will now hand back to Councillor Wharf. Uh, thank you very much, Susan, uh, Paul and Rupert. 
before we go to the recommendations, I would like to say thank you to Paul, Rupert and Susan for this hugely important piece of work, which has been very informative and is very content rich. And I think uh, I hope members and members of the public listening will have found what has been said useful. It took us quite a long time to prepare what we said so that it can be presented in a relatively short space of time while doing justice to the very good work that Paul, Rupert and Susan have done. There is an action plan within the report which is quite detailed but I would just like to make the point that this is an ongoing piece of work and it will be going forward for quite some time because this isn't something you can just say we've finished and very largely we've got an understanding of the areas that we're moving in and we've got some identified actions there will be others to come so the recommendations before you are to note the initial impact of the lockdown phase of covid19 on vulnerable groups in dorset and that is in appendix one to note the findings of the roundtable discussions with councillors, that is in Appendix 2, summarised. Agree that the council needs an ongoing assessment of the impact on vulnerable groups throughout subsequent phases of this pan pandemic. Agree the action plan outlined at Section 5, Appendix 1. And note that this initial assessment has been undertaken largely by staff released from core roles to assist with the COVID-19 response. And what I'm saying is we've taken people from out of their areas which have had a reduced level of service and they have done a phenomenal piece of work on what they've done here. <coughs> uh, the actions that set out in section five will require appropriate resourcing and oversight and that will be a matter that I will be looking into. Scrutiny committees will review and there will be a number of discussions certainly not fixed yet. So I commend the recommendations and I hand back to Councillor Spencer Flower, the leader. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Peter. I know Laura wants to make a quick comment and I'm going to invite uh, a couple of members who have indicated they want to speak. Laura. Thank you, Spencer. Yeah, I just wanted to echo Peter's comments, really. Um, it, it was incredibly interesting to sit on this group um, and I really um, appreciated that opportunity. Um, I think it is content rich. There's there's a lot of great stuff in the recommendations and, I, and I'll support it um, wholeheartedly. I just wanted to offer um, a, a kind of anecdote, something that um, was raised in, in one of the meetings that particularly pertains to how we go forward with adult services and how we approach disability and things like that. Um, I had contact from a lady who appreciated that she had been shielded. She appreciated that she needed her food delivered. She appreciated the work that we had done during Community Shield to do that. Um, she also said, I'm a graphic designer. I'd love to help somebody. So I think that out of this piece of work, um, we must also recognise that whilst we are giving sort of giving light and giving space and attention to groups that desperately need it and may be left behind, we need to recognise skills as well. And we need to really um, offer opportunity um, so that people don't feel that they're just a problem and we accept that everybody has something to offer. It's just going to be in different ways. Um, and I think this is a fantastic piece of work. So um, thank you to Peter and thank you to all the officers um, for leading on this. Thank you, thank you, Laura. Um, I've got um, two speakers, Brian Heatley and Paul Kimber. So Brian. Uh, I didn't mean to speak, Spencer. I don't know what, what I've done. To, OK, all to right, Brian. Well, you, you're obviously popular. I mean, I quite <laughs> didn't take you off the uh, my order form if that's what you yeah, want to do yeah, remove me okie doke all right thanks thanks brian paul kimber uh thank you spencer uh, fellow councillors and uh thank you for the report and i'd particularly like to place on record to thank sue rupert and paul for this uh in-depth report I, I wanted to ask a couple of questions i noticed in the report there was i understand in the vulnerable groups there was eight uh, rough sleepers that uh, we couldn't, uh, for the one of better words, we couldn't do anything with. If I give you all the questions, the two questions on, on that and whether, whether, whether you'd like to comment, are we doing enough to try and get the rough sleepers housed or um, find accommodation for? And the second question I wanted to ask, I noted in the uh, L LGA news sheets that we get every week, that we expect repossessions to be up around 
13%. And has there been any consideration reg regarding that very area? And it's a very high number, a very worrying number. Uh, thank you, uh, Spencer, fellow councillors. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, Peter, I know we might, given we didn't get notice of the questions, we might uh, want to take them away. Graham's indicated, I think he can probably deal with one or possibly both of them. I, I think he probably can. And I, yeah. I, it, it, I, I, I will certainly ensure with Graham that there is a detailed answer to this. But I think Graham can probably cover that because he's been doing a huge amount of work on it. Thanks. Yeah, th thank you for the question, Paul. I mean, in response to the eight rough sleepers that wouldn't, they just didn't want to be housed. I mean, with, we are working with them constantly uh, on, on a sort of daily, weekly basis to to engage with them and give them that option. But um, we we couldn't force them into into um, coming into settled accommodation. Um, but we are working with them with the out outreach teams. I hope that helps answer the question. I think the second bit, Peter, might um, be better. I don't know. Can't. But that certainly with the rough sleepers, that's the bit I can help you with. I'll respond to anything else in writing later. OK, Peter, I think that's sensible. Um, I've got it in the chat box. I noticed that uh, Paul Ingledon wanted to come back and respond to Laura Miller's comment. I'll let you come back. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, uh, Councillor Miller made a, a very important point about um, how we might look to see people less of a, as being solely about a problem to support um to engage with them or to encourage them to uh make contributions as it were um and it was very heartening recently to have conversations with some office colleagues who have been looking to do some training for the call um line staff which was very much in keeping with that point uh, they were looking to try and encourage the, the call handlers to explore people's strengths um, and to build on those strengths. So, so to explore with them whether it was possible that they could address their own issues e either directly themselves or, or in in line with their family, neighbours, friends. Um, but perhaps the next step over and above that would also be um, what people might have to offer to others. So someone might not be able to go out and get their prescription and they might be home based, but they might be, for example, have a past record of being a counsellor and they might be able to offer telephone support to people. So it's a very, really important point that strikes a chord and resonates really <coughs> strongly with the strengths based approach that adult social care looks to promote. Th thank thank you. you very, thank you very much, Paul. Peter, any, any final word before I put it to a vote? Uh, no final word no. other than to repeat the quality of the work and the commitment we've had from Public Health Dorset, our own councillors and the officers. We, but we must take this forward because there are a lot of outstanding issues that we can't afford to leave and they won't be solved in one swoop. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you, Peter. I think it's a really, really good piece of work, a very important piece of work. And I'm sure colleagues uh, across the across the chamber will take this this forward as urgently as we can. So can we agree, colleagues? Agreed. 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 Thank you very much. We move on to agenda item nine, which is a statement of licensing policy 2021 to 2026. And Tony Olf is going to present. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And we have two papers on licensing policy, and um, I will give a brief introduction to each of those. And we do have uh, John Newcomb um, available for any uh, particular questions that need to be asked. Um, both of these draft policies have a similar um, background. Um, they've had consideration by the licensing committee in a Microsoft Teams uh, meeting, and also uh, the um, documents have been presented to members generally in a briefing session. So I will keep my introduction fairly short. The first item we have is licensing under the Licensing Act 2003. And the sort of act, uh, activities that we're talking about here are the sale of alcohol by retail, the supply of alcohol in qualifying members clubs, the provision of regulated entertainment and the provision of late night uh, refreshment. Um, 
So the sort of licenses we're talking about are premises licenses, personal licenses, temporary event notices and club premises certificates. And the sort of premises licenses we're talking about are, for example, pubs and bars, restaurants, hotels, theatres, off licenses, supermarkets, nightclubs, festivals and events, uh, members clubs and village halls. Absolutely key to an understanding of licensing is the licensing objectives. And in the case of the Licensing Act 2003, there are four of them. They are the prevention of crime and disorder, public safety, the prevention of, nu of public nuisance, and the protection of children from harm. And we use the licensing policies to set out how we intend to promote licensing objectives and and give our operators the example of knowing what our expectations uh, will be. Um, the key policy contents are we promote the objectives, we talk about the cumul cumulative impact zone uh, which currently exists in Weymouth. The uh, proposal, and this is part of the consultation, is that this uh, cumulative impact zone should continue. It represents effectively a policy applicable to a, con a concentration of licensing uh, premises, licensed premises in a particular area. We also talk about enforcement and reviews and also provide um, sample conditions. We're intending the consultation to run for 12 weeks, uh, <coughs> starting fairly shortly and uh, we will receive that back and we have the intention that uh, the um, outcome of the consultation will be reported to the scrutiny committee. Um, in terms of approval, it will need approval by the licensing committee and full council. So that ends my introduction and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. I've got um, three members have indicated to speak um, the first one being John Andrews. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Spencer. Appreciate that. Um, I'd just like to say a big welcome to John Newcomb because I don't think many members have met him yet. In fact, I haven't met him as vice chairman of the uh, of the licensing committee. I'm speaking today on behalf of Emma Parker, who's on an online licensing course, funny enough, this morning. Um, so uh, I'd just like to welcome John, um, who is the uh, service manager and licensing and community safety operations manager. Um, uh, he, his, his role has been fantastic in, in these policies, bringing together the policies of the former district councils um, uh, together uh, and integrating them and presenting them to us. We, we, we uh, are the licensing committee are not a priority committee, but we did meet informally, uh, but virtually uh, to go through these policies uh, and they have our full blessing. And I'd like to thank John, Aileen and the team for um, being, enabling us to uh, bring this report to, to you today via Telmi. Um, so um, that was all I wanted to say really, apart from the fact that we, we've had co uh, a licensing committee, albeit um, not, a, not a formal one, but we have had a formal sub-licensing committee, our first one last week, uh, which was chaired excellently by Emma Parker, uh, uh, along with uh, officers from licensing, Aileen and, and uh, uh, Elaine Tibble from Democratic Services and um, uh, David Northover. Thank you very much. It worked very well. Um, <clears throat> we know we can do it. Uh, and the next one takes place, I think, in a couple of weeks time. So the sub licensing. But uh, welcome, John. There we go. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I've got uh, John Oral. Do you want to read your question, John? Well, I'll, I've, I've got my question, but it's been slightly superseded by Mike Garrity's emails in the last uh, 48 hours, which kind of gives me an outlet to answer the specific problems um, which were around the sitting out licences, which uh -huh. come out post COVID. And while this may be fine for village pubs, uh, my area's got all the nightclubs and late bars. So if people sit out until 5 a.m., that's going to cause trouble. So, but that'll be answered by Mike Garrity's and, um, email. So, 
uh, superseded really. So if I can just put, put it a plea for the um, and um, really emphasize that cumulative impact area. I've got most of the nightclubs and late night bars and this cumulative uh, impact area is very important. So I'm pleased that you're recommending carrying it on because uh, we really need it. Thanks. OK, thank you, John. Uh, Daryl Turner. <clears throat> thank you, Leader. Um, really following on from something John Oral just said, um, could I don't know whether we can actually be taken to page 118. And it's 9.1 to 9.3. It's quite a way down in the actual document itself. And it's it's surrounding the um, late night levy. And I know this is a document for. Um, in readiness for consultation, however, at 9.3, it says the licensing authorities not currently satisfied that is an appropriate to introduce in a late night levy, I believe that perhaps a start point should be that it, that it is appropriate to produce a light night levy, um, mainly because um, of the appropriateness of giving contribution to the police and an improved presence in many areas at night. And I do believe that many people in the council area will feel better protected against the impact of alcohol by an improved police presence. So I just wonder what the cabinet think about actually um, just changing that one line of the document in readiness for the consultation. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Can I ask you, Tony? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think in the first instance, it's a matter for consideration by the licensing committee. And um, having said that, I would not wish to delay the consultation on this policy starting. So I think that um, the point has been raised, which is fair, and we can treat that as a point raised for consultation purposes. We will also register whether similar points are made by um, residents, not only of Lyme Regis, but perhaps other places as well, that um, give us cause to reflect on that in further detail. So uh, while I take the point, I'd prefer not to make any change to the policy at this time. I think the point's noted, Darren. We, we obviously, that's part of the consultation process. I don't think it's hard and fast. No, no, I, I, I appreciate the, the I know answer from Tony, but it's just the fact that I'm not speaking for Lyme Regis. I'm the chairman of the place scrutiny and I speak for Dorset Council area. Thank you. OK, yeah, thanks very much for that, Daryl. Well, I've got no other um, speakers. Um, so I'm going to open up to colleagues. Any comments from the cabinet <clears throat> on this on this particular item? It's going out to consultation. Uh, it's, as John um, Andrews points out very well, that it's had a good look at by uh, by the licensing uh, informally, admittedly, but by the licensing committee. Any further comments or can we agree? We're happy to support. All agreed? Yes. Agreed. 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 Thank you very much. Let's move on to agenda item 10. Statement of Gambling Licensing Policy 2021 to 2024. And it's you're still in the chair, Tony. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, we're talking about the Gambling Act 2005. And in some respects, it's quite different from the um, approach that we were talking about earlier on, uh, simply because for gambling purposes, we are not the sole um, licensing authority. Um, we work in conjunction with the Gambling Commission, which have certain detailed involvement, and they are also responsible for online ga uh, gambling as well. So that's not an area that we, uh, we touch. And in many respects, the work that we do is relating to premises licensing. Um, and in addition to that, there are certain permits for gaming and also um, we have some licensing authority in relation to small society lotteries. Um, further detail about this, uh, the sort of premises that we might be talking about are bingo, betting, um, adult gaming centres, family entertainment centres and possibly casinos, so I don't think we have any in, uh, in the Dorset area, um, horse racing and uh, dog tracks. Um, the types of premises we're talking about, betting shops, bingo halls, amusement arcades, gaming, gaming machines in pubs and clubs. 
Um, under gambling, there are also licensing objectives which direct the work that we do. And there are three of them. Um, the first of which is preventing gambling from being a source of crime and disorder, being associated with crime or disorder, or being used to support crime. And ensuring that gambling is conducted in a fair and open way. And finally, protecting children and other vulnerable people from being harmed or exploited by gambling. And I do know that this is a major issue uh, for many people, major concern, I should say. Um, as similarly, we um, set out in our policy how we will intend to promote the licensing objectives and give the operators um, some understanding of the approach that we will be taking. Um, policy contents, protecting children and young people, um, local risk assessments, licenses, conditions, and also uh, enforcement and engagement. It's gone through a similar process to the alcohol licensing policy, and we will be looking for the uh, approval by the licensing committee and also uh, full council in due course. Um, I think that is more or less it. It gets a 12 month um, uh, consultation uh, 12 arrangement. Weeks. Say 12 weeks, I should say, not 12 months. And uh, 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 that will be happening or starting shortly. That is the end of the introduction and I support and propose the recommendations. Thank you very much, Tony. I've got one speaker, um, John Andrews. Yeah, thank you, uh, Spencer. Once again, um, very well done to John Newcomb and his team for putting together this policy that, that integrates everything from the old district councils. I would just like to say that we're we're all very concerned about online gambling and, and it's definitely seen a rise uh, during this period to the fact that uh, we set up a, a group to look at online gambling and um, tackle the gambling commission, commission's lack of um, uh, action over what is currently going on. Um, so, uh, and we want to go out on the roadshow um, when we're allowed to. Um, a very heartwarming st a story from an ex police officer who got into all sorts of trouble uh, with gambling, who is now leading the fight against uh, online gambling. So we're setting up that group. We set up that group and we're, we're looking at forward to putting something together so we can go out and definitely educate the younger people. Because once you get into this habit, it's hard to get out of. Um, that's all I'd like to say, Spencer. Uh, thank, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. You make some, you make a good point there. David Taylor, do you want to speak? No. Yes. Bear with me. You do. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. I can't see yes. you, but we can hear sorry, you. Sorry about that. I just had the camera. It's all right. I should be on now. Thank you. There I go. Uh, just to reiterate what John's just said, we set the group up to look at the gambling problems we've got, but also we're working in uh, with the. Um, uh, where is it now? It's uh, the civic, civic advice centres and things like that, so we can actually get them to be what they're doing. They work across Pan Dorset as well. So just to say we are really working on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Well, colleagues, you've heard the report presented by Tony Alford. It's going out to consultation. Anybody want any make any comments or can we agree? Happy to agree, Chairman. All agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you very much. We'll move on to agenda item 11, the Community Safety Plan 2020 to 2023. Graham Carr Jones to present. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so before uh, introducing the plan, can I just thank Andy Frost and his team for all their work bringing this forward through the pandemic. And I'd also like to pay a bit of tribute and thanks to Councillor Kirby. Andrew Kirby was the, the former chairman of the Community Safety Partnership and he for, for many, many years and, and he did absolutely a sterling job. And just so really to recognise that um, him, that Andrew Kirby and Bill Pipe for their stewardship of the community uh, safety partnership hitherto. So for over 20 years, ever since the introduction of the Crime and Disorder Act in 1998, local authorities have been under a legal duty to, to tackle community safety. 
And we do this by working with other agencies, such as the police, the clinical commissioning group, and probation services, many of whom are under the same legal duty as ourselves. The work is coordinated through the Dorset Community Safety Partnership, which is a statutory partnership body that's set out in legislation. Uh, the Community Safety Partnership produces a three year community safety plans that are revised annually. The plans set out the partnership's priorities and how they will be tackled in broad terms. To inform the plan and determine priorities, we undertake an assessment of relevant information and data and ask people who live in the area for their views on local community safety issues. The latest plan was agreed by the Community Safety Partnership on the 9th of March this year, and it contains a number of priorities, including rural crime, fraud, domestic abuse and antisocial behaviour. The process for developing the plan was considered by the Council's place scrutiny in January this year. And although the COVID-19 situation has impacted on the way we work, Partners have met regularly since the start of lockdown to understand and address community safety issues by working together. They're now developing a detailed delivery plan with longer term actions to tackle these priorities. It's a legal requirement for Dorset Council to formally adopt the community safety plan, and I'm asking Cabinet today to put forward a recommendation to full Council to do that. So if there are any technical questions, uh, questions of technical nature. I know that Andy Frost is here and he'll able to, to help us. With that, Chairman, I, I propose that we uh, send this to Council. So, thank you very much, Graham. I don't have any non-executive speakers, can, so therefore can I open it up to the Cabinet? Have you got any, any questions for Graham? Or can we agree that we recommend a, that gets a recommendation to, uh, to full Council? Agreed. Happy to agree. Thank Agreed. you very much. Thank you. Thank so you, we Jim. go on to agenda item 12 now, which is the option for prohibiting use of disposable barbecues. Whilst this was not on the forward plan, I agreed to the request because I felt this was a really important issue and one that we need to deal with as quickly as possible. So I hand over to Ray Bryan now to uh, to speak to the item. Yes, uh, thank you, Leader, for allowing this to be brought uh, forward. Whilst it's not on the forward plan, it does just show just how flexible we can be uh, when the need is there. Uh, the report has been prepared in response to a number of incidents of the damage across Dorset as a result of the use and or disposal of barbecues, in particular the fire in Wareham Forest. Um, we've also had difficulties with Heathland and public waste bins across Dorset. The report shows uh, uh, that there is little risk in th this options report, but it does highlight the fact that it's a high risk if we don't take some actions. And it's always very sad to see the wildfires taking place. It also has a tremendous effect. These wildfires have a tremendous effect uh, on the climate implications as per the report. Wildfires emit carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. They also damage forests, woodlands and shrubs that would otherwise remove CO2 from the air. I think that's a very important point that we bear in, in mind as we look at this. The reasons for the recommendations are quite clear. It's to protect Dorset's habitat, habitat ecolog ecology and wildlife, is to protect human health, is to protect Dorset councils and others' private property, and to support the safety of Dorset's emergency services and DC staff. Um, I'm, I'm going to end up by just saying that uh, um, the recommendation is quite clear and, and, and it reads that working with Dorset and Wiltshire Fire and Rescue, and I'm going to add who have obviously the greatest experience and other partners, the cabinet, cabinet are asked to uh, 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 accept recommendation one and two as, as stated in the report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ray. Before I open the debate, I know that Rebecca Knox, who is the uh, chairman of the Dor uh, Dorset and Wiltshire Fire and Rescue Authority, wishes to, to speak. Rebecca. Um, yes, thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to make some comments on behalf of the Dorset and Wiltshire Fire Authority. 
Um, it, it's it's great that there is some real partnership working going on, on in order to bring the report to you. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that you've brought it as a, a matter of urgency. Um, yes, there has been some significant fires, particularly as, as uh, Councillor Brian mentioned, the Wareham Forest Fire. And just to state that although the report um, reflects, says that it was 180 hectares, it was actually 220 in the end, which is a vast area of our, of our countryside. To the other end of things, um, it's not just the very, very large significant fires. And I'll just draw your attention to how the Fire and Rescue um, Service respond. On one night, just one night, um, in uh, around Studland, one of the crews from Swanage extinguished 30 disposable barbecues just in one area that all of them had been left smouldering. That's just in one night. It would have been reported as one incident, but in fact, that's 30 different ones. And that that just reflects on the, the number of responses and the number of incidents we're getting dotted all over the countryside. There, there's a huge clamour um, and petition which says let's ban the sale of these disposable barbecues. That's actually not the position um, that I mean, it's wanted to explore further, but, but in order to get something enacted very quickly, uh, that is actually something which can only be con really controlled by, by national standards and national legislation. But there's a there's a really, uh, really important point here to nudge both our retailers and our and our uh, whether they're visitors or residents to the appropriate use of um, not only disposable barbecues, but lighting fires in public places and also how to extinguish them. So I think there's a huge communications effort that we can still all work to together and I'm delighted to see that's in recommendation too. Uh, the, the paper um, outlines some legislation which we and other partners can actually probably implement even further than we are doing at the moment. It's already in place and those are, are listed in the report. If we could actually empower officers um, to, to use that current legislation, then the, uh, we could actually make some progress and hopefully end some of these incidents which not only cause damage to um, to our countryside, they are dangerous to animals, to people. Um, digging them in on beaches is just not safe. They might go out, but they are very, very sharp and horrible things. And they also do smolder for a very long period of time, even buried in sand, for instance. The alternatives for banning barbecues um, would be for people to make up their own. That is also significantly dangerous because not everybody knows how to build a safe barbecue. And if you're out in the countryside picking up pieces of wood, etc., to light one, that could be even more dangerous. Um, the, the report does state that uh, you would like to enter into um, further discussions with partners about then consulting on what is known as a public safety order. I'm just wondering whether it would be possible actually to um, bring forward the consultation to have a PSPO now so that that 12 weeks can kick off as soon as possible alongside the conversations having with partners. That would mean that in 12 weeks time we would be potentially in a position to bring forward that PSBO, which would give um, others and the Dorset Council the ability to concentrate a little bit like a local outbreak management plan for, for use of um, fires and disposable barbecues and other types. Just bring forward that because if we wait for more discussions and an options paper, but not kick off that consultation, we might be looking at not being able to do that PSPO work until um, uh, October time at the earliest. So that's just a, a request. Um, I know from the fire and rescue service point of view that would help enormously because just actually taking an action today 
uh, and starting that consultation would raise the profile yet again so that we can provide more evidence out into the public through the publicity campaign and almost have the nudge effect to extinguish the use of uh, lighting, whatever type of fire it is, in public and on various types of um, land owned by whether it's the private sector or other public sector organisations. As I said, there's a huge amount already there that we could turn on now. And if you can turn on that consultation response with a PSPO work, that would be very much um, welcomed. Thank you, Chairman, for the. Yeah, thank you very much, Rebecca. Ray, do you want to come back? Uh, yes, if I may, because I, I value everything that, that uh, Rebecca has just said. She and I have had one or two conversations on this over the last few weeks, and I think it would be a very good idea if we're legally allowed to start the consultation now. And I'd ask Jonathan Mayer, who hopefully is still on the line here, uh, to look at uh, and, and respond to me as to whether we can start that consultation virtually with immediate effect. This is not something that we can we can leave just uh, uh, dangling on. Uh, 12 weeks is still a long time, but that's where we are. But let's try and pick up as much speed as we possibly can. And I hope that the uh, um, the cabinet will uh, wholeheartedly support this. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much, Ray. Comments from the cabinet? If not, can we agree the recommendations? Thanks, Agreed. Yes, Laura. Agreed. Sorry. If I may, just what really wanted to support this as someone whose friend picked a smouldering yeah. disposable barbecue out of a bin the other day. So I, I wholeheartedly support this. Excellent. Well done. So we all agreed. 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 Thank you. Thank you Andrew very much. Andrew wants to speak, Chairman. Sorry? Andrew Parry wants to speak. Oh, Andrew. Um, I just spot that. Chairman, I, I was going to absolutely endorse this. Two years ago, um, my former Ferndown uh, division uh, was subject to a, a large uh, heathland fire on Ferndown Common that caused tremendous devastation. It caused great anxiety to residents whose properties neighboured the common because we are all acutely aware that you, if you have a sudden wind change of wind direction, um, the potential for harm to properties and people mm. becomes incredibly serious and, and happens very rapidly. Um, and in respect of the barbecues, uh, I certainly welcome the acknowledgement that is it, it that in addition to the uh, potential harm it creates in woodland and heathland areas, is the very real harm it can create when they're used on the beaches and they are not oh, absolutely disposed of properly under those environments. So really, it was to echo my full endorsement of, of plans for us to consult on this. Thank you very much, Andrew. I think we all share the sentiment that we've heard this morning on this on this really important piece of work. So, Ray, it pays as, as we can. So I'll, just for the benefit of transparency, can we agree? Agreed. 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 Thank you very much. We go on to uh, uh, agenda item 13, which is capital funding of embankment improvements to the River Brit at West Bay. And I think, uh, Tony Ferrari, you're going to uh, open this up, aren't you? Thank you, Chair. Yes. Uh, can I start with a brief resume here of how we got to this point? Uh, we have an issue to resolve at West Bay. West Dorset Council had spent £3 million on coastal flood defences, but the river flood risk still had to be dealt with. We as Dorset Council inherited a proposal, um, and at that point, can I offer my thanks to Councillor Brian? Um, he has a lot of expertise in this area, and he challenged the proposals that we had inherited, and these new proposals results uh, of his efforts. Um, he'll speak more about that shortly. The floodworks itself needed £1.5 million. We looked at how to fund it. There were a number of options. We could sell the land and use the capital receipt to fund the works, or we could bundle the fund funding of the works into a lease for a new tenant. We looked at the options and it was clear that funding the works out of a new contract was the best option. The return on the lease is significantly better than we could achieve by using the capital receipt from the sale of the site to repay debt. Um, we explored other options, including um, bringing it forward as a residential development, and the planning justification of doing that was poor. So the best option is the one we brought forward, which is to fund the flood works out of the new lease. 
One particular benefit of the proposed approach is that we are keeping in place the existing tenant. They've managed the site for over half a century and we are confident that uh, no change in tenant is a low cost and low risk option for the council. Financially, I commend the paper to cabinet and can I pass over to Councillor Brian now for his comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Ray? Yes, thank you, Tony. Um, I wholeheartedly support the recommendations that are on this paper. I am so pleased that we've managed to reach an agreement uh, subject to the board of directors accepting it from the company involved, of course. Um, but, you know, we, we have gained tremendous input uh, uh, of uh, funds from this and <clears throat> it's, uh, it, it's now in the nice position where we actually uh, don't have to pay for the restoration work or any compensation. So I fully support the, the recommendations as, as per the, uh, the papers. Thank you very much, Ray. I haven't got any non-executive speakers. Anybody on the cabinet wish to comment, bearing in mind that uh, if you want any detail, we'll have to go into exempt session. So uh, we, we need to rely on the uh, uh, details that uh, Tony Ferrari and Ray's put out, but uh, anything beyond that, we'll have to go into exempt. Anyone got a comment? Or are we happy to agree? I'm happy to agree, Chairman. All agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Now we've got a, a Ray's going to give us a verbal update on climate and ecology emergency executive advisory panel. Ray. Yeah, it's a very simple one. Uh, we have just released to the EAP um, the strategy report and we'll be considering that on uh, Friday. I'm sure there'll be some fairly healthy discussions on it. Um, what we're having to do is try and uh, uh, be realistic. I said right from word go that I would only support anything that I was sure we could deliver and that's still the case and uh, as I say the strategy report comes out on Friday uh, to the EAP it then goes to scrutiny and thank you to Councillor Turner for allowing us to take it to scrutiny at very short notice and then I hope to be bringing in fact I will be bringing it back uh, to the cabinet in the July cabinet meeting. Thank you very much, Ray. I've got an indication that Paul Kimber wishes to speak on this item. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Spencer and Ray. Uh, yeah, I, I, I welcome this uh, report. Uh, it's just uh, to ask you about the journey. And, and, and the reason I ask is because uh, I was I was lucky enough to uh, go to have a meeting on Saturday uh, with, a, with, a, with a great speaker called Bob Hoskins from uh, Totnes and he outlined several areas of, and very actual um, cost free areas as well that improvements we can make but my main question is uh, the input to this document how will the public at large be able to make an influence into this thank you Ray do you want to touch on the process Yes, I mean, in fairness, it will go to consultation um, for the public to get uh, to be able to express their views. As, a, as I said earlier, I'm sure there'll be one or two people who are unhappy with certain parts of it. Um, this, this is the strategy. The action plan uh, is being finalised uh, as we speak. <clears throat> but obviously for the action plan to have any meaning, we need to make sure we've got it fully costed. Um, but certainly this is now in the public domain or will be uh, in the next few days. Uh, and I look forward to hearing comments from the public on this. Thank you very much, Ray. Cabinet colleagues, any comments, any questions to Ray? Or are you content with his update? Content. Thank you very much. We have no exempt, we have no urgent business members. So at 12.12, uh, .12, I'll bring the meeting to a close. Thank you very much. Thank you.